Hello to all. My name is Lopa Banerjee and I am your poetry writing instructor in Richland College, Dallas. And today is my first video session which I want to share with you all and possibly with other writers who are interested in the craft of poetry writing beyond the scope of this class, I mean. And uh, as I had already uh, given the course contents in Blackboard and also in email, the week two, which is which starts from today actually, week two is my analysis of two very important feminist poets, Maya Angelou and Nikki Giovanni comparing and analyzing their voices, their themes, the presentation of their themes. And we, most of us know that both Maya Angelou and Nikki Giovanni, they are two prominent femini feminist voices in African-American literature. And both of them are also critically important in the context of literary and the literary and cultural renaissance that defined their works. And both of them also signify a legacy of free spirit. So I have chosen two poems for now, comparing and contrasting in terms of the voice, presentation, theme, two poems each of Maya Angelou and Nikki Giovanni. Let's go to the poems directly. All other additional materials I have in word file, which I will also share in Blackboard and in email simultaneously so that you can have access to both. And this presentation of mine is an, is an effort on my part, a small but subtle effort on my part to get myself more acquainted with you so that you can have a, a human interaction with me, hear my voice and moreover to familiarize uh, you with my style of an analyzing poetry and working on poetry, which is very important and vital if we want to cover poetry writing as a workshop. So let's analyze two poems today, Mothers by Nikki Giovanni and Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. So we are doing a comparative study of the voice, narrative, styles and themes of both the poems. First, it is my pleasure and honor to read out the poems out loud because you know the, the voice, when I read out the poems, the vibes which I will be given, giving you one on one will really matter. This is what I believe in. <clears throat> so the poem Mothers by Nikki Giovanni. The last time I was home to see my mother, we kissed, exchanged pleasantries and unpleasantries, pulled a warm, comforting silence around us and read separate books. I remember the first time I consciously saw her, we were living in a three-room apartment on Burns Avenue. Mommy always sat in the dark. I don't know how I knew that, but she did. That night, I stumbled in, into the kitchen, maybe because I have always been a night person or perhaps because I had wet the bed. She was sitting on a chair. The room was bathed in moonlight, diffused through those thousands of panes. Landlords who rented to people with children were prone to put in windows. She may have been smoking, but maybe not. Her hair was three quarters her height, which made me a strong believer in the Samson myth and very black. I'm sure I just hung there by the door. I remember thinking what a beautiful lady. She was very deliberately waiting, perhaps for my father to come home from his night job or maybe for a dream that had promised to come by. Come here, she said. I'll teach you a poem. I see the moon, the moon sees me. 
God bless the moon and God bless me. I taught it to my son who recited it for her just to say we must learn to bear the pleasures as we have borne the pains. Such a simple yet haunting poem which was written in 1972 and uh, the link which I found in poetryfoundation.org I am sharing from that link. It uh, says the source as the collected poems of Nikki Giovanni which came out in 2003. If we try to analyze the poem there are so many layers though it is a very simple poem but there are multiple layers. Let's talk about them. So what do you think about the title? The title Mothers implies a very seething document. It is a seething poetic document reflecting on family because it is a relationship of mother daughter which comes out in the garb of childhood memories. So it is a reflection on family as well as race. Why race? Because she talks about black lives in terms of the community that she saw as a child. So you can say that on the surface it is about the microcosm means about the home in which her childhood was nurtured. But if you reread the poem, if you read between the lines, then what will you see? You will see that it reflects on the black lives, the community which it represents through the mother-daughter relationship, the black lives of the America of the 1940s and 50s. And most importantly, it was written as a young mother when Nikki Giovanni was a young mother to her son as an aftermath of the civil rights movement in the US. We all know about it. And also significantly this poem might be considered as a foundation for her other famous poems. We all know about, most of us know about like Nikki Rosa. It's again a very famous poet poem which also reflects on the poet's search for her identity. That is written about her life as a young woman. This one is exclusively dedicated to her childhood. It analyzes her childhood in a close-knit African-American home. Nikki Rosa also does the same but it is an adult voice mostly as far as I remember. But we will come to that poem later on again. And Mother's is all about her childhood voice, how that is reflected. The first few lines of Mother's, let us go there, go to the first few lines. How does it open? The last time I was home to see my mother, we kissed, exchanged pleasantries and unpleasantries. Isn't it jarring? It starts abruptly with the chemistry between the mother-daughter. And you see, you, you can notice if you read the poem closely, there are no capital letters in line breaks, no punctuation, and the whole poem is written in a single flow. It what does it indicate? It indicates the rawness of emotions as reflected in the child mind, the raw memories of her childhood which comes to the fore. Things unsaid between the mother daughter, yet the warm comforting silence that emanated around them. Then again the lines, I remember the first time I consciously saw her, we were living in a three room apartment on Burns Avenue. Mommy always sat in the dark. I don't know how I knew that, but she did. This is a characteristic of her mother that she unfolds in her poem about her living in isolation. That night I stumbled into the kitchen, maybe because I've always been a night person or perhaps because I had wet the bed. From this part, the poet indulges in some cultural commentary on black lives. It's her characteristic poetic way of telling how a black child feels in a moment of isolation like this. Because she sees the daily paraphernalia around her, the lifestyle of the community around her when she was tender aged and young. So there is the reference to the mother's sense of isolation, how that impacted her child psyche, how that uh, 
might even be reflective of other women like her other children like her in the community the mother as a woman she she reflects the sense of isolation and it may be indicative of the other women in the community also the reason why i think mothers in the title of the poem is plural again these lines the room was bathed in moonlight diffused through those thousands of panes landlords who rented to people with children who are prone to put in windows so it's reflective of the cultural truths the white landlords the black tenants with families and children the childhood comes alive through surreal images seen in the everyday lives that is why there is the reference of this window panes these are the little tidbits the reminiscence of the little details of her mother's appearance behavior which mattered even in her memories of her childhood when she is writing the poem she is not a child per se but the the memories which are reflected in the poem they refer to her child psyche and how she saw her mother in terms of that again notice there is a biblical allusion in terms of describing the mother's hair what is the significance here there is a reference to her hair the exact lines are are her hair was three quarters her height which made me a strong believer in the samson myth and very black <coughs> excuse me so uh, here the uh, biblical myth is of samson samson who came at a time when the, when the israelites were accused of disobedience to god they became oppressed by the philistines then what happened god gives them samson samson comes as a messiah to deliver them and god's advices samson to never cut his hair samson had long hair his strength came from god and he lost it when he was disobedient uh, disobedient to god the myth says this in the end samson realized that the strength was not in the hair but it was in the obedience that he was given to god so what it uh, what are the lines hinting at the mother with the long hair and the samson myth is because the poet wants to depict her mother's ob- obedience to god being a devout follower of god a devout Chris- christian she portrays her mother's religious ardor there is a subtle reference of her hair and through that she gives a commentary of the characteristic of her mother as a devout christian again there is the thought of legacy of mother daughter which comes alive in these lines there's a reference to an irish uh, ballad or i think an, an irish uh, lullaby or uh, allusion so there's a reference to a poem here come here she said i'll teach you a poem i see the moon the moon sees me god bless the moon and god bless me i taught it to my son who recited it for her so this is the legacy because the poem within the poem it is a like if we analyze the structure there's a poem within a poem and what is that it is an allusion to a famous irish lullaby that she quotes or refers here and what do we find here we find the culture of acceptance the culture of tenderness affection obedience to the mother's roots to her lineage and also the poet's pledge to recite the poet the poem taught by her mother to her son it's a legacy passed on from one generation to the other through the passage of birth the act of reciting the pass, uh, the pa- act of passing on to her son is an act of surrendering to the roots so what do we get in the final analysis of the poem here the poem embodies the tone of gratitude also of power also of affection what is the power here it is the power of the guileless childhood which comes to the fore its myriad bitter sweet experiences and the the subtle force of it the subtle force of legacies the subtle force of memories and uh, in a word in, in a sentence how is the style the style is distinct distinctively different does it have any similarity to uh, the other poets of the contemporary era i think it is very distinctive unlike any other poet of those times because it is marked by crisp poetic touches in colloquial everyday expressions she doesn't write in a sophisticated way because she wants to 
depict the childhood memory as it was in all its rawness and in all its gusto and in all its fervor. Now, in comparison to this poem, we have Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. Let us read the poem. Let us listen to this uh, poem which I'll read out now. Still I Rise. You may write down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I have got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want... To see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide. Welling and swelling I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I'm the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. This poem, Still I Rise, is from the collection And Still I Rise, a book of poems, 1978 by Maya Angelou. And the source is the complete collected poems of Maya Angelou, which was published in 1994, which was again republished in Poetry Foundation. It is archived in poetryfoundation.org. So isn't it a brilliantly powerful narrative of resistance, empowerment, which this course is all about, like po how poetry can act as a vital tool, a very significant tool of resistance and empowerment and descent. So Maya Angelou's Phenomenal Woman and Still I Rise. These two poems are considered milestone poetic creations. Milestones in the context of black lives, black cultural studies, race, identity, also a strong feminist poem in its own right, like both of the poems. But today we are only discussing Still I Rise, maybe if Sometime I have some extra time, we might go back to Phenomenal Woman and analyze that. So what is the backdrop in which the poem was written? The backdrop is clearly a patriarchal cultural pattern and in that it is a poem of resistance. Not only a patriarchal cultural pattern, but also it is the racial discrimination, which is at the heart of this poem. The, the constant revolt in a repetitive use of the lines, still I rise, is the root of this poem, is, is the backbone of this poem. How does the poem begin with? With the startling lines. You may write down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust I rise. Which is a stark truth and a reminder that Poetry emerges from the extraordinary darkness of life. Is it a very light poem? No, it is born out of darkness. With gusto and vigor, it is born out of darkness. The darkness of slavery, of generations and generations of black lives. It lays bare dark, untouched recesses of the human nature. The, the first lines are a powerful utterance of the poet's spirit of revolt her empowering statement of struggle. What are the challenges here? The challenges are the prejudice and injustice prevalent in the society of our times, not only towards the women, but also towards the black population of the times, the inherent theme of racial discrimination, which I already referred to. 
and these lines reflect how her voice can be a symbol of resistance resistance against power play white supremacy oppression so again a few lines about the voice and the power of the poet what do we find about the voice of the poet here unquestioned authority of her poetic voice the the poem becomes almost an anthem it was so popular that you you can see the video which i have the the video in youtube which i have listed later in this document from which i am uh, making this video you can see the total number of views of this video and originally when it was written and published it became a rage the poem became a rage and as a performance poem because my angelu was a very famous performance poet and a stage actor as well this poem became a beacon of hope for the oppressed and downtrodden it became so popular it became a smash hit because of the subversive voice of the poet the poem also becomes a reminder of the abuse of power but in spite of the negativity and oppression around her what characterizes the poem is it is a prominent message of hope isn't it because there's this repetitive use the repeated use of the powerful phrase i rise what is the message here that the poet and her tribe will emerge stronger no matter what the circumstances or adversity again let's go to these lines does my sassiness upset you why are you beset with gloom cause i walk like i have got oil wells pumping in my living room just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides just like hopes springing high still i rise isn't there a pronounced defiance here what is the defiance here what does the defiance signify it signifies her pride in her cultural and gender identity as a woman proud of her african american roots her lineage the uniqueness of her culture and her also her appearance as a black woman maya's utterance here is through the distinct use of metaphors the use of the figurative language though it is used you know the poem uh, is written in a figurative language it is strikingly bold and it hits the nail in just the right place does my hotness offend you don't you take it awful hard cause i laugh like i have got gold mines digging in my own backyard again so many rich metaphors here the metaphors of define and resistance the metaphors which are so uniquely her own creation and as a message how does it work the metaphors cumulatively work as an antidote to subservience of the people in power the metaphors of the gold mines then again the shoulders falling down into tear, like tear drops i missed that line uh, see did you want to see me broken bowed he bowed head and lowered eyes shoulders falling down like tear drops weakened by my soulful cries here the metaphors of the gold mines again the shoulders falling down like tear drops are characteristic of maya signature style again there are some bold adjectives like sassiness sexiness hotness what do they serve in the poem they cumulatively prick the conscience of the readers and in this connection i found a very nice literary blog aulkation i have shared uh, what the blog tells about the poem in its an analysis of the poem if this poem were, were a sculpture it would have a granite plinth to stand on the natural imagery is far reaching and the voice is loud there are moon sun tides and black oceans a clear daybreak and ancestral gifts all joining together in a crescendo of hope so isn't it a brilliant analysis about the metaphors which are the backbone of which is the like the metaphors are cumulatively the backbone the essence of this poem and in every line there are similes and metaphors that abound every stanza at least from the first but still like dust i rise the metaphor of the dust is used to such a dramatic effect and such a powerful impact it creates let's uh, now go to the last two lines out of the la last two stanzas out out of the huts of history's shame i rise up from a past that is rooted in pain i rise then again 
Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I'm the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. What are the metaphors here? It is the metaphor of wondrous human accomplishment of rising. Rising to find the poet's voice, defying the oppression, defying the barriers with grandeur and optimism and uniqueness. And here in the final stanzas, final two stanzas, the issue of oppression reaches a climax. But then against that, there is this metaphor of rising. What does the metaphor of rising do here in the final analysis? What is your takeaway from the poem? The takeaway to me at least is the metaphor of rising, which enables the poet to reclaim her roots, her persona, her heritage and finding herself, finding her moorings, finding her voice as the true champion of empowerment and resistance, representing black women of all ages. And finally, it remains a wonderfully inspiring, empowering poem with a powerful repetitive energy. What is the repetitive energy? The bare reminder of the lines, till I rise, till I rise, till I rise, which is pitted against the metaphors, the fine use of, the rich use of metaphors used in both the poems. So here I end my analysis of these two poems and the reason I have kept them together is to show the cumulative impact of these two strong, bold feminist poets who raised their voices as subversive forces and subversive forces of, you can say, feminism. Also, again, important strands of their work is the, are, like includes the legacy of free spirit and the power of their poetic vo voices, which come across in the depiction of the poems with, with their remarkable beauty, strength, and the victory here is the victory of the human spirit, the soul of the black woman. Thank you so much.